Welcome, everyone, to the PFF Fantasy Podcast IDP Edition. I'm John Macri, and we have officially reached the bye week portion of the season, which, when combined with all the effing injuries to our precious fantasy options, can be enough to, to throw many wrenches into the plans of fantasy managers. But luckily, we have got all the data and key information to help you through it, so you can come out of this stretch stronger than ever. And that starts with getting a win in Week 5, so let's get it. <music> I think I, I really have the uh, the perfect guest for this week with the bye weeks factoring in and with the injury Grim Reaper out here looking to crush our souls. I've got the man who knows just how to clap back and make sure what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. The cornerback whisperer himself, the legendary Johnny the Greek. Johnny, what is up, brother? Hey, man. Good to see you. Good to be here. Yes, we were talking about this before we got into it. And, and uh, we were talking about how pain tolerance is the most important factor in fantasy football these days not drafting not waivers not knowing players it's pain and frustration tolerance that's it that's <laughs> really a, so much of it right like because a lot of people that play fantasy maybe play casually or whatever they're, they're not willing to kind of stick through it or be on top of the waivers and stuff like that and be as active as you know maybe some of us true degenerates here right so i i say it in our waiver wire show all the time just staying active make sure you're adding to your team and, and always looking to fill those holes because that gives you the, the leg up on almost half your competition most of the time right so it's very important and you're right yeah pain tolerance that is a a, a good way to kind of put it because man the injuries have been insane this year so we're going to get into it there, there's plenty of um backup options that we're going to be looking at potentially starting this week but yeah i'm very excited so i, I i'm glad that uh, you, you got the time to do this with me because yeah i've been looking forward to this yes sir absolutely and uh we're gonna hopefully get you on idp bets here soon too so uh we'll do a little little cross uh platform here but uh glad to be here thanks for having me man Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I would be happy to do it. Um, but yeah, for this episode, we're we're going to be going uh, again, as we usually do game by game, breaking down all the key information um, to get you ready for the week ahead. We're not covering like the obvious players that are, you know, never leaving your lineup. So don't expect to hear too much about the TJ Watts of the world, for example, but more of the information that is going to be useful for actual lineup decisions for some of the lesser known, but IDP relevant players for for every game. Um, don't worry if, if you don't want to listen to the whole thing. We we have the timestamps for each game in the episode description as well, so you can jump around, find the games that you're looking for, um, and I'll have the IDP fantasy report and IDP rankings article linked into the episode description as well. So, with all of that out of the way, Johnny, what do you say we get into it here with Thursday night football and an NFC South divisional matchup between the Bucks and the Falcons? Where would you like to start with these two teams? Oh man, there's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, obviously, the the uh, the Dennis injury, maybe KJ Britt becoming relevant again. But I want to start with you know big shock here, a cornerback question. Uh, so so a lot of guys been talking about Jamel Dean. You know, doubled his projection twice already this season, tripled it once. Uh, I'm sure you've gotten this question as well. Is it luck or is it alignment? I haven't seen anything alignment wise. What what do you put this down to? Just right place, right time. A little bit, right? Like the uh, the Falcons are a slightly better team this year, I, I guess, right? Like where you know they're they're able to pass the ball more. They've I, I'm trying to remember what their scores have been in games, but teams are you know probably passing against them a little bit more as well. But yeah, Jamel Dean, um, and who is it? Zion McCollum, um, is the other outside corner there, right? So yeah, is it Zion McCollum? Yeah, Zion McCollum, um, for for uh, yeah, Bay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then, and then Christian Izian, who's got the weird Izzian. designation. Yes, right, yeah. right. Yeah, Izian is playing. Yeah, he's he's only playing because Antoine Winfield has been out, right? So he's been yep. playing as safety. Um, but yeah, they, those guys have been getting targeted, and I think you know what Zion McCollum. I'm pretty sure if I if I look it up, has been like one of the higher graded corners for us. So he's been like really good. So I, you know, I know we like to reference your. Um, theory of the lesser of two evils uh <laughs> um on the show and i'm pretty sure zion mccullum has been pretty good this year i'm going to look it up really quickly and that could be the reason too that jamel dean is just getting targeted 
And yeah, he is a 90.2 coverage grade so far this season for, for Zion McCollum. Yep. So uh, very possible teams are, are more looking to avoid him more than anything. Uh, dude, absolutely. So I picked up Zion in all 22 and I got him nice. with Jalen Johnson and Riley Moss, uh, who I also got this year, yes. who I know we'll talk about. So very, very good corners on the all 22 team. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. For people that uh, aren't aware of the all 22 fantasy platform, just basically taking um, PFF grades and using them towards fantasy points. Um, really good platform. You could use offensive linemen in there, obviously IDPs and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun and definitely one that rewards good players more more than you know kind of our game a little bit which is a lot of reactive and you know tackle stats and volume based right but all 22 looking at the the skill of the actual players on the field which is fun so um yeah tampa bay an interesting team like you said um christian isian's been out there because antoine winfield doesn't look like he's going to be back uh, again this week I, I don't think he's practicing so not a good sign for for a short week here but other than that i mean yeah you mentioned servasi dennis is now on ir kj Britt. I would think is going to play a larger role because they've been trying to keep him away from playing passing downs. It seems early in the season, right? And they might not have much of a choice. Like I thought if Antoine Winfield was back this week, that there'd be a chance that they'd roll out three safeties, Whitehead, Winfield, and Izian, and, and, you know, limit Brit on passing downs even still, which they might do at some point, but um, not probably not for this week. So I, I would be okay with starting KJ Britt um, a little bit more so than I would in previous weeks. Um, yeah, how about you? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So it was last time I looked, it was like 50 50 uh, Brit and Servaccia, uh Dennis there uh, mm -hmm. split. So, yeah, I mean, you, you got to assume that, that Brit will get a few more snaps out of that. Um, what What's your take on JD Bertrand, though? So, with all the, you know, catastrophic injuries to linebackers last week, put in a lot of waiver wire claims for linebackers. This is the one guy I, I, I did not get. And Troy Anderson's already been, you know, designated out this week. So what's your take? Is he a good start for, uh, for this Thursday? Yeah, I think he could be like a fine start kind of in, in deeper leagues, right? Like I think the way that, or at least what Atlanta showed us last week was that they were actually kind of starting to take, Anderson off on a few situations like he obviously he had a monster game 16 tackles a pick six so it wouldn't have noticed in in the in the box score but Bertrand when he came in I think they were taking him off on obvious passing downs and I, I imagine that's another situation that they'll probably do the same thing so I don't think it'll be a full-time role for him but he's going to be a starter and and probably play around like the 75 percent snap range somewhere around there so deeper leagues I, I think he could definitely be be a fine option yeah. And, and we're, we're already at the point of the season where do they have a pulse? Do they play football? Um, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's basically what it is. Right. Especially like you said, like if you're, you know, a, a Troy Anderson manager, like JD Bertrand's not somebody that's rostered in, in a lot of formats, especially redraft. He wouldn't be out there uh, or on many rosters there. So um, yeah, this is a situation where injuries and bye weeks he's definitely an option for, for certain leagues. So Bertrand, interesting. Um, the other player I, I was going to talk about is uh, D. Alford, Sweet D. Um, he, I, I wanted to cover some more of these kind of nickel corners a bit for folks. And Alford is one that I, I think should be in a decent spot for snaps this week going against the Bucks, um, who played the sixth highest rate of 11 personnel in the league at 76%. So, um, so far, Alford has really yet to play over 75% of snaps, but that's come against the worst teams at, at utilizing 11 personnel. So Pittsburgh, Kansas City, New Orleans, um, even Philly was right around average, and that was his best snap share that week. So Tampa Bay, pretty good op matchup for corners. They're giving up the fifth most tackles to the cornerback position. He might be like a sneaky one this week, like playing primarily in the slot. Um that I might not mind, like, again, in those kind of deeper formats, really in CB required, required leagues. But, um, yeah, thought you'd appreciate Sweet D. Alford there. Oh, dude, absolutely. It's, it's you know, if you've got a good, effective passing offense across from your corner, I, I can live with the not perfect playing time if it's, a like, an ideal setup like that in, in like, a, a nickel corner or a slot corner or whatever. If, they, if they've got the alignment that mm -hmm. beats, at, you know, that beats out imperfect playing time sometimes, I feel like. Yep, absolutely. It does. Um, yeah, there's a lot of those guys this year who maybe don't play 100% of snaps, 
hover around that 75 to 90 percent range and put up some monster performances and, and we'll talk about a few of them here um in in the next few games worth of uh players um anything else from tampa bay atlanta for you no those are the, those are the big ones i saw yep makes sense um okay a uh, quick ad break before we move on to the Sunday slate. Uh, and this is from our friends over at DraftKings. The best part of football season, checking out the post-game stats. Which wideouts scored more than two touchdowns? Which quarterbacks threw for less than 350 yards? Think you can pick who will do what before kickoff? Then play pick six from DraftKings, an official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. Download the DraftKings pick six app, select between two and six players, and choose if they'll have more or less of a stat. It's that simple. And for all the first-time pick six players, check this out. New customers can play $5 on your first pick six set. Get $50 in Pick 6 credits. Download the new DraftKings Pick 6 app now and use code PFF. That's code PFF for new customers to play $5 on your first Pick 6 set. Get $50 in Pick 6 credits only on DraftKings Pick 6. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org in Connecticut. Must be 18 plus. Age and eligibility restrictions vary by jurisdiction. Pick 6 not available everywhere, including New York and Ontario. Void where prohibited. One per new customer. Non-withdrawable. Pick 6 credits expire in six months. Limited time offer. See terms at pick6.draftkings.com slash promos all right let's go on to the sunday slate now and we'll start with the london game johnny uh the london games are back um new york jets uh minnesota vikings and i kind of want to start with um quinn and williams a, a, a little bit here because quinnan's been off to kind of a slow start this season just hasn't quite looked like himself just yet like he has had the one sack on the year he's managed just a 64.2 pass rush grade which is 44th for his position i think if there was a week for quinn and williams to get back on track it should be against the minnesota minnesota vikings interior offensive line who ranked 28th in pass blocking grade um with a 49.5 that's their interior offensive line not their offensive tackles um and have given up the second highest pressure rate as well at 21.9 percent we know williams has the talent we've seen him deliver elite pass rush metrics as recently as last season over the entire season we've seen it once just this year um and i just hope that this is kind of the week for him to get back on track but how are you feeling about quinn and is it are you frustrated by him? Are you ready to give up on him? Are you waiting on him? What, what, what's your thoughts? No, I mean, we've seen the ceiling before. What did, what was that, like a 14-sack season he had a couple of years ago? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we know it's there. We, we knew coming out of college that it could mm -hmm. be there. So, no, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, you know, I, I've seen this movie before. We just got to wait. It's coming. Uh, what I, what I want to ask you, though, is since uh, Jermaine Johnson's gone, um, Hassan Reddick never showed up, uh, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, is, is Quinnen seeing more double teams now due to that, or, or what's that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't looked at the double team. Like typically, the interior guys do see more double teams. It's just the nature of where the, where they line up, kind of thing. But I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there is kind of an increase. If I did look at the numbers, just because they're like the offensive or the defensive line is just different now, right? Like like you said, Jermaine Johnson's gone. Will McDonald has been good, but he's not quite the same level of player as you know Hassan Reddick or uh, Jermaine Johnson. You know, guys that they've had in those roles before. So. I don't know the exact numbers, but yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if he's getting more attention. But it's already harder to rush from the interior of the offensive line than it is from the edge, right? So you know, you look at the edge guys this week. Will McDonald specifically, like he definitely draws the tougher assignment on paper um, this week because the Minnesota offensive tackles Brian O'Neill, Christian Darrisaw, they've been really good um, at protecting the passer, and and I, I worry a little bit more about him, but I'm hopeful for for quinn in this week um I, I think he could come through hoping yeah and, and and you know defensive tackle hasn't really blown up this season yet either i mean buckner had that huge game week one mm -hmm. then immediately went to ir and you know we won't yeah. see him for a while and you know uh god uh matabuike hasn't done much um Zach Sealer hasn't done much. Christian Wilkins hasn't done much. Like, so it's, it's kind of like the tight end of uh, IDP right now. You <laughs> oh, know what I mean? So, so, you know, if you've got this level of talent and it's proven talent and we've seen it before, I would just wait for it to happen. If it yeah. were me. Yeah. Especially at the defensive line. Like it's one of those positions we got to be patient. Like there's going to be guys that pop off, you know, the Patrick Joneses uh, of the world, but those guys are 
we're not trusting that long term. So, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing for the for the Jets is wondering if CJ Mosley is going to be back. I, I thought he'd be back last week. It seemed like he was close the week before, but um, if not, Jamie and Sherwood a fine replacement. He's played a full time role in CJ Mosley's absence. So that's really kind of it for the Jets for me. Anything for you? Yeah, no, not not nothing crazy there. Um, the, the safety is interesting note uh, we've got here. Vikings are 28th allowed in uh, points to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you had to pick one this week, because I feel like there are a lot of leagues where Tony Adams and Chuck Clark um, are on waivers, maybe in shallower yep. leagues. And, and if you had to pick one, which one do you think you'd go with? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think I have Chuck Clark uh, ahead. Um, I think he's just played really well. I mean, Tony Adams is, has had his moments for sure. Um and he's had those games where he's lined up a ton in the box. I think he had that again last week, but I think it just depends on the matchup and going against the Vikings who have a pretty good passing offense right now. I'd imagine that um, they don't necessarily see that high box usage this week, Tony Adams and Chuck Clark. So in that case, I probably lean Chuck Clark. Yep. And, and just real quick shout out for anyone who, you know, everyone should be reading your uh, weekly IDP report article. Um, the alignment data in that is absolutely incredible. Like that is so useful to have to, you know, uh, that's going to be your roadmap to production, knowing where the alignment is on these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's some key kind of um, box snap players that are, you know, kind of hidden right now, and then they do pop off. Um, but then, you know, we can kind of expect that production to, to stabilize throughout the rest of the season and put them ahead of some of the other guys that are kind of interception heavy or big play heavy right now that isn't stable, right? So um, on the Minnesota Vikings side of things, not a ton here. Greenard, uh, Jonathan Greenard and Andrew Van Ginkle kind of been the, the, the top guys here on the defensive line. I mean, it's not the worst matchup that's for sure they've, they've been pretty solid i think i have both of these guys inside the top 20 edges this week because greener he should see more of tyron smith but tyron smith hasn't been amazing this year and then on the other side of the jets offensive line is olu fashionu um, who's their 11th overall pick from this year he has a 31.3 pass blocking grade, which ranks 75th out of 76 qualifying offensive tackles. Um, so Andrew Van Ginkle has played well, and I, I think he has a chance here to kind of take advantage of it. Um, yeah, Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, he's taken some sacks too this season. So uh, I don't mind the matchup for, for the Minnesota edge rushers this week. Yeah, and Minnesota's been getting out to real fast starts too, and then setting up a negative game script for their opponents, right. and then and then just you know teeing off basically the entire second half in almost every game this year they've played. Mm -hmm. So you know I, I've run into trouble with that where it's like I don't know if I've seen a real Minnesota game. Yes, Green Bay came back a little bit last week, so we kind of got a real read on things, but it's been all blowouts. So like, who does play a hundred percent of snaps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's the thing um yeah it's uh, they're i mean just like we all expected right with sam darnold um being uh, yeah. in, in the mvp conversation <laughs> through the first quarter of the season so uh yeah it'll be interesting i mean i i they look pretty good i mean they got the weapons there so well and i think they're getting tj hawkinson back at, at some point soon they've they've opened the practice window for him so yeah it could be a good thing for for the pass rushers um uh potentially there for for minnesota so um uh, other than that the only other thing for, for Minnesota, for me, Ivan Pace hasn't played, uh, didn't play last week. Actually, didn't play the week before either. Cameron Gruger Hill filled in. But really, Cameron Gruger Hill didn't play quite the same snap share as what Ivan Pace would. Um, that was more Josh Metellus, um, who really kind of played that secondary linebacker role. Um, he lined up a ton in the box. I, I can't remember. It was up over 50%, I believe, um, even last week. So not a bad... Um, idea to kind of lean on on like a metellus if ivan paces out more so than a camera gruger hill um who played i think just like 34 percent of snaps last week so not interested in in him if ivan paces out um okay let's go to the miami dolphins and the new england patriots next johnny um where do you want to start with these two teams this is so i mean obviously jalen phillips uh going for the season again that's that's not great news um you know really devastating uh but something positive though emmanuel agba a guy that i used to have on so many rosters back in the day uh you know idp staple for many years yeah. uh is once again an option 83 percent of snaps last week the only thing that upsets me a little bit is he's a linebacker in yahoo 
which makes no sense at all. But he's a he's a defensive tackle in my fantasy <laughs> league. So that's like extra valuable. I love that. I'm like, you know, so a little weird, but great option, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think the designations were clearly um, some wires crossed there for Emmanuel Ogba <laughs> because uh, you don't often see that where one a guy's a DT on one platform and a linebacker on the other. But yeah, kind of not as great on Yahoo, but yeah, love that for, for DT required leagues. Um, <laughs> on MFL. So yeah, definitely sucks that Jalen Phillips is out. Um, David Long, their, their other starting linebacker potentially out again. I'm not sure. Um, he wasn't able to go on Monday night football. Anthony Walker stepped in and, and played full time for David Long uh, it, it, on Monday night. So I imagine that Anthony Walker once again would kind of be a full time option there. Jordan Brooks, probably the best option um, as we saw on Monday night again. But um, the other injury for Miami was Jordan Poyer. Uh, he left the game didn't return. Not sure the extent of that one, but uh, Marcus Bay is his primary backup and really doesn't carry like a ton of value more just for, you know, those leagues that are deeper and starting safeties when they're valuable um, just for being a starting safety that that's where IDP managers might want to consider an option there. But anything else for Miami for you? Yeah. And I mean, it's, you don't have to chase this to start with, right? Because New England's 21st in allowing safety production and they're the worst passing attack in the league and the worst offense in the league yeah. right now. Uh, them or Miami. I, I was looking at this earlier for betting related content and it's 31 and 32 for overall <laughs> offense. So uh, the under may be in play this week. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably a good bet. We saw um, Tyler Huntley provide absolutely no spark to that Miami <laughs> offense. So uh it was brutal um yeah it, i could imagine this is going to be one of the worst games um of the week so hopefully they surprise us and prove us wrong but odds are that's not going to happen um on the new england idp side of things um the new hotness uh keon white uh he, you know he's, he's cooled down like slightly since the start of the year but at least in terms of production like still posting really strong pass rush metrics, 90.8 pass rush grade on the year lines up against both tackles throughout a game. We'll see if um, Teron Armstead, the left tackle for Miami, Miami is back or not, but otherwise he gets um, Patrick Paul, who I, I don't even think has played a snap really. Uh, maybe he's played a few, but not a ton. And, and then on the other side is Austin Jackson, who, who has struggled uh, quite a bit. And then like we just mentioned, Snoop Huntley there at quarterback. I really like this matchup for, for Keon white this week. Yeah, love this guy. Uh, when uh, Buckner went down, I'm in a couple of these weird leagues where, you know, you need DT, you need DE, and then mm -hmm. you also need DL. And I, I plugged in Keon White in the, the DL slot and have been super happy with that. 84% of snaps out of this guy yeah. just last week. And he's gone over that, I think. I saw 90 uh, one week there. So, yep. it, you know, just incredible playing time. And availability is the best ability, right? Like if you're out there that much, you're going to luck into some plays every once in a while. Uh, not to mention that he's pretty good to start with. So Yeah, yeah. It always helps to, to have that added bonus of being like actually really good at your job, um, especially when you're playing such good like high volume of snaps and Keon White yeah right now looks like kind of the total package so I'm I'm definitely in on him as a, as kind of a locked in starter going forward until he gives us reason otherwise and then yeah it's it's so different from you know kind of the Bill Belichick days where there was such a heavy rotation um so right away we see a nice heavy uh line or edge roll there for Keon White replacing Matthew Judon who who was one of the heavier edges um in in volume but Kyle Duggar, um, the other New England IDP kind of worth talking about, did get injured. He got carted off with like an ankle injury. I don't think he's going to be back this week. He might be back in a couple weeks. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like they're placing him on IR. So hopefully that means good news. But in the meantime, I mean, Jabril Peppers, really nice alignment for him uh, in New England and his replacement, Jalen Hawkins, um, also playing a ton in the box as well. Like New England likes to put these guys down closer to the line of scrimmage. So if you're in, you know, a desperate spot here for, you know, a box heavy safety or something like that, like Jalen Hawkins or Jabril Peppers, one of the two um, nice options here to fill in for, for Kyle Duggar. Yep. Yeah. I picked up Hawkins today uh, in a couple, couple places where you, you, you know, all these wild leagues are in where you need like four safeties or six safeties or whatever, like, is you know, but uh, yeah, great option there. Uh, and something I saw last week that was a little weird, but I, I think the blowout explains most of it is Marcus Jones and Jonathan Jones seeing a huge reduction in snaps, Marco Wilson playing some, et cetera. Uh, you know, it, when you see that in a blowout, it's usually blowout rest, you know, from what I've seen. Um, 
So, but just something to keep an eye on this week. It, it, and, you know, if you are a shareholder of Marcus Jones, Jonathan Jones, it's Miami with Tyler Huntley. You don't need to roll them out this week to start <laughs> with. So maybe stream someone else instead. Just just say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a lot of cornerbacks out there and a lot of them that are playing much safer snap shares. So, yeah, no need to get too crazy with it, especially at this point in the season here now where we're kind of fighting for our lives to, you know, avoid the injuries and, and the bye weeks and stuff like that. So. Um, we'll go on to the next game now, which is the Buffalo Bills at the Houston Texans. And I guess we'll start with the potential return of Terrell Bernard for the Buffalo Bills because he is expected to return to practice this week, according to, to Sean McDermott. I don't think he has yet, but they seem pretty optimistic about it. So the only thing like for Bernard, like I think if he's he's out there, you're, you're fine to start him. Um, it means he's healthy and, and they're OK with him because. Um, He's been one of the better IDP linebackers, only played two of the four games this season. But if he's healthy enough to go, that also kind of eliminates Balen Spector as an IDP option. He doesn't, Balen Spector, who's been playing more than Dorian Williams, doesn't necessarily move into the LB2 role. Dorian Williams is going to hold that LB2 role. It won't be a full time role. Um, but yeah, just keep an eye on that. If you're a Balen Spector manager, basically, um, he, he won't be useful if Terrell Bernard is active. So, um, other than that, uh, there are injuries, other injuries for the Bills kind of worth looking at. I mean, Taylor Rapp, like a shoulder or a concussion or something like that from uh, th this past week. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but he might not be available. And the Texans have been the best matchup for safety tackles so far this season, giving up the most tackles per game to the safety position. So I might consider like a Cole Bishop or, I mean, DeMar Hamlin as well um, as potential streamers this week if you need them if you got guys on bye weeks or you're dealing with injuries i think both of the buffalo safeties um can be pretty strong options this week and then johnny do you know anything about what's going on with teron johnson I, I think he was back at practice this week not sure if he'll he'll start or not what do you think yeah no he, he was back at practice uh as I, I read it uh this afternoon yep so uh he was back practicing which is good yep. uh and you know to be frank though even if he's not i, I picked up so much cam lewis as a replacement um you know, I mean, he's technically a safety on MFL, but he's a, a cornerback in Yahoo. So I'm using him everywhere in Yahoo. Mm -hmm. He's been fine. He's been stellar. He's He's yeah. been very productive and, you know, playing starting snaps and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're good either way. Cam Lewis is not exactly a household name. So odds are you could pick him up if Teron can't go this week. But, you know, Benford or, Raz or Razul Douglas is right. fine this week either, you know, as well against the third overall passing attack, second in wide receiver targets across the entire league. That's that's pretty good setup, I think. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, yeah, Houston giving up the third most tackles to the cornerback position for those exact reasons that you just mentioned. And yeah, Cam Lewis, like if, if Teron Johnson is out again, um, I, I think in a, one of those guys that could be in a nice spot here just because of his alignment plays in the slot. He's, he's their nickel corner, right? But um, Houston does play, I think, the 14th uh, highest rate of 11 personnel this season. So around 64% or so. So Lewis will come off the field a little bit, which probably limits his ceiling. But because of where he lines up and because of the the offense that he's facing this week like he could still find ways to kind of be productive for sure um let's look at the texans for a, a second here because will anderson and, and daniel hunter have been relatively quiet through the first month of the season this is another kind of duo you know that we're we're, we're still kind of waiting on but anderson specifically i've been a little bit um interested in just to, to look at because he hasn't really flashed the pass rush ability that we saw from him as a rookie just yet right like it's possible that you know we're looking at maybe like a slot a, a sophomore slump kind of thing but at the same time it's so early in the year and, and that could be turned around pretty quickly right so it's something to kind of monitor but it's also not an easy matchup this week against the buffalo bills so like i'm not you know chucking these guys to the waiver wire if they don't do anything like the bills are a really good offensive line and Josh Allen is excellent at, at avoiding pressures to turn into sacks. Right. So um, it's, you know, it's not an ideal matchup. I probably trust Daniel Hunter more so than Will Anderson at this point. Um, even though Will Anderson has, I think one more sack than, than Hunter, that doesn't really matter. Hunter's got the better pass rush metrics playing time is there as well. So not giving up on these guys just yet, but just kind of being mindful of the matchup, I guess. Yeah. And, and I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of places where it's like, 
uh, you see some of these big names on waivers because people have gotten frustrated and gotten rid of them. Like there's a reason why they are the big names to begin with. We've seen it before. We know the metrics are there. We know the production has been there in the past. They've got the draft capital. They've got the hype. Like it's coming. It's just not, it's just not linebacker production. It's a different kind of production. It's not an every week thing. It's an every other week thing or an every three weeks thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You got to be lucky to be able to get sacks, uh, no matter how good you are, right? Like we saw it uh, th- this on Monday night, Aiden Hutchinson was dominating that Seahawks offensive line and they were just getting the ball out like a split second before he can get a sack every single time, right? Like it's one of those things like you need the quarterback to throw, hold on to the ball, just like the split second longer. You, you need the offensive lineman to be beat on the play. You need to be there quicker. It, there's so much that goes into getting a sack for, for a defensive lineman or a pass rusher. So um, yeah, no need to panic. We trust the talent and we follow the snaps as well. So other than that, for the Texans, um, Henry To'o To'o, uh, Hanky Tutos got a snap raise last week. Um, he, he was coming off the field on like most obvious passing downs in, in previous weeks, but then he played all but one snap in this last game. Um, so if he's going to continue doing that, I think that's another nice boost for his um, kind of IDP viability going forward as well. So just just thought that was an interesting um, thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, good good matchup this week too. So the the Bills have most definitely changed their offensive identity since like midway through last season. Like oh, it yeah. it was blindingly obvious and they started it with like 200 yards on the ground against Dallas, yeah. right? And and they have not been the same team since. They pass as much as they run. They're a balanced offense. It's harder to know what they're going to do every week and they're winning games cuz of it. So I I think uh Aziz or Henry here are in a great position for a big week. Uh, James Cook has been awesome too. I mean, yeah, yeah, he had a stinker last week, but you know, it happens. It, he's been great. Yeah, yeah, it was a tougher matchup last week too, right against the the Baltimore Ravens. I remember writing about him in the our, like our O line D line matchup article. He was somebody that I was kind of fading that week because the Ravens are so good. But like, like you said, like the Joe Brady offense here for Buffalo's worked really nicely for them. And I think it works nicely for the, the Texans linebackers this week as well. So um, yeah, like both of those guys um, let's talk about the Cleveland Browns and the Washington commanders, Johnny, where do you, where do you want to go with this game? Uh, let's start with uh, Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa. Um, I've got a few shares. I mean, it's, it's been acceptable, but uh yeah, you know, the playing time has been up a little bit. I remember the mm-hmm. days when when it was you know 75, 80 percent of snaps, and we were happy with that. Uh, you know, got the contract playing full time, so you know that I, I'm I'm happy with it. <laughs> it's been really nice to see. Like I I was concerned coming into the year that he was just going to kind of continue being that that sub package guy just because of how they they did this defense you know in previous years and and then under Jim Schwartz last year and. Um, really, really encouraging to see him being a, a full-time player essentially here every single week. And, um, yeah, I think I got him as like LB 21 this week. He, he's, you know, it's a, it's a nice matchup against the commanders given up, I think the sixth most tackles to the linebacker position. So you like that. Um, doesn't seem like Jordan Hicks, uh, is going to be able to go this week. I know he left last week's game, hasn't been, um, practicing and, uh, he was replaced by Devin Bush. So Devin Bush, Really a deep league play only, though. Again, not a terrible matchup for for linebackers, but there it won't be a full time role necessarily for Devin Bush. So just keeping that in mind as well. Um, oh, and Grant Delpit, I, I think this is kind of their real LB two, right? Grant Delpit, he he's he played fifty percent in the box last week. Um, this is another one of those matchups that's great for safeties as well. Giving up the fourth most tackles per game to the safety position are the Commanders. So um, Delpit's another guy that I, I really like a lot this week. Yep, definitely. That that Washington offense has been surprising also to say good. to say the least, right? Like Yeah. I, I love when we get like one of these rookie quarterbacks come into the league and like hit the ground running, right? And look as good as Jaden Daniels has looked. And yeah, he's he's been exciting. I, I hope he keeps it going because big fan of his. Um anybody else on Cleveland for you, or you want to talk about Washington? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, Miles Garrett always a little bit dinged up, but he pushes through, you know, if if he, if he is physically able to play, he, he will play and he can win you your week any given Sunday. So, you you know, that's never a decision. If he can play, you play him. 
So. Yeah, we, we, it's funny. We talked about it exactly that last week, right? Because he was dealing with like multiple injuries. And, and you know, I, I had said like, if he's active and breathing, you're starting him, right? He, he, he <laughs> He's just too good. I mean, we saw what he did uh, to the Giants the week before when he was banged up. And then, yeah, he played like 75% of snaps somewhere around there. Got two sacks this week. He's just, he's a freak of nature. Um, yeah, he's just impossible to bench at this point. Um. How about on the Washington side of things? Anybody uh, stand out for you on the commanders? I mean, nothing immediately. Um, <clears throat> Benjamin St. Juice. I, I mean, I'm a little concerned that the real life, you know, football talent production is eventually going to get him jammed up and benched at some point, which is unfortunate <laughs> because he gets picked on a lot because he's, yeah. you know, because of that and is very good as a uh, cornerback option. Yeah, Benjamin St. Juice. Yeah, he's been solid. He's he's got to be one of the top scorers. Like he's inside the top twenty, I think, in most um, IDP scoring formats, and he's been really good. Uh, Mike Sander still, I, I think, could be a lot of fun too. He's another one of those kind of nickel cornerbacks um, in the league. He did play like exclusively outside one of the weeks, but I think they did move him back to the slot. Um, good matchup this week for him. Um, the the Browns have played the third highest rate of 11 personnel. So he's another guy that I think should be good to go um, in a positive matchup for cornerbacks this week. But really the, one of the main things for me in this matchup, the Washington commanders defensive line versus the Cleveland Browns offensive line. And it's not so much that the defensive line for Washington is so stacked as much it is, as it is the Browns offensive line is absolutely terrible. They're giving up a ton of pressure. So, um, I had the numbers here. One second. I will tell you exactly. So the Browns. Okay. So they get this. The Browns have allowed more total pressures at 129 than any other team this season. The next closest team has allowed 99 pressures. So they've allowed 30 <laughs> more pressures than the next closest team. They have been Swiss cheese to say the least. So the player I like the most is Dorrance Armstrong, um, who's been performing well um, for the commanders so far. And he now kind of has the sack production to, to show for it as well. He had a, a sack and a half last week. Um, he draws, I mean, just a favorable matchup here. Deshaun Watson has taken more sacks at 19 than any other quarterback. He, he's got the third longest time to throw as well at 3.05 seconds. Armstrong has been solid, 76.4 pass rush grade on the year. Um, that's currently a career high for him. So on pace for a career high in, in total pressures as well. Like Armstrong is one of the guys that I like quite a bit um, for this week going against that terrible Browns uh, offensive line and, and Deshaun Watson. Yep. And, and we're into the time of year where you need to stream guys in situations too, between injuries and bye weeks and all the shenanigans going on. And I, I can pretty much guarantee you Dorrance Armstrong's available in many yeah. leagues right now. So yeah, you know, get, go get the situation for the week, make your, make your team the best version of itself each and every week, and then just repeat that all year and you'll be, you'll be fine. That's, yeah. that's all this is. Yeah. It's a beautiful formula. Um, all right, let's go to the Baltimore Ravens and the Cincinnati Bengals now. And, uh, I guess we'll start with the Baltimore Ravens, um, defensive line. Odafe Owe stands out to me. He's kind of having like his first true breakout season, um, here, at least through the first month of the year, right? Like he's, his pass rush metrics have been excellent. 86.2 pass rush grade, 20.6% win rate. Those are both top 10 marks among all defensive linemen, um, through the first four weeks. Uh, Kyle Van Noy has been incredibly productive back to back two sack games. He's been excellent. Um, the only player that really hasn't been has been, um, Namdi Matabuike, like you mentioned earlier, right? So regression, we we did expect regression for for Matabuike coming into this year. Like he he had that ridiculous like NFL record streak yeah. of, of sacks, right? So wasn't it? It was it was like twelve weeks in a row or something. It was, it was some, yeah. It was yeah. something stupid. It was like it, it, there was no way it was going to be repeatable. Um, and and we we had warned about that all season, and it's really coming to fruition early in the season. Not to say that he can't turn it around or anything like that, but only a half sack so far. Um, and he's third among defensive tackles on his own team in pass rush grade with a 62.5 for the year. Again, hopefully he bounce back, bounces back, but he's not, you know, 
in that kind of must start territory, I guess, right now, um, if, if there's other better DT required um, league options, which let's be honest, there's not a ton, but um, like you said, it, it's not a position that we can normally trust, but you never know. You might, you might have somebody, but uh, Matt Abuike, not necessarily a must start. Um, other than that, for the Ravens, uh, Trenton Simpson, we, we talked about, we've been talking about his stock kind of trending down. The, the Ravens just aren't trusting him on, on passing downs. But Kyle Hamilton is coming off a, a couple uh, productive games after a quiet start to the season, you know, the first two weeks, that is. Um, I, I think most encouraging that, that I saw with Hamilton as far as his usage goes was kind of a shift in how the Ravens used him, um, where they allowed Marlon Humphrey to, to cover more of that slot role. And um, that was something that Kyle Hamilton was previously doing. And then they gave a bigger role to the rookie cornerback, um, Nate Wiggins, right? So Nate Wiggins stayed outside. Humphrey kicked in the slot a little bit more. And that opened up Hamilton to kind of get more usage in the box, which was nice to see. Um, because that is definitely better for, for tackle production, more so even than the slot, right? So um, Hamilton going against the Bengals this week. They've yielded the sixth most tackles per game to the safety position so far this season. So I think Hamilton's in, potentially in for another nice start this week. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that because you can see the correlation in the um, stats when this started happening a couple weeks ago against the Cowboys, I believe, is, is when this all started changing. Uh, Humphrey's box scores have been up the last two weeks. Uh, Nate Wiggins went from 46% of snaps to like 80-something last week. Uh, so you can kind of see this thing happening in real time. Uh, and that's great for Marlon Humphrey because, I mean, you know, a lot of people jumped ship uh, last year and the year before because what was it three years ago when he was almost overall IDP cornerback one off of that insane season where he had like, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was forced fumbles. It was like yeah. 10 forced fumbles did it. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that like the following off season, we were like, yeah, don't chase this production. It's not going to happen again. And of course he was drafted as like the number one corner. And then people are like, what the hell's going on? And then they dropped him. Right. So yeah, it'll be nice if he can get that um, slot usage continuing here in, in the, the latter half of the season or oh, it's so, so early. I'm saying the latter half, there's like 75% of the season still to go here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of it for the Ravens for me. Um, on the Bengals side, I don't have a ton um, for the Bengals. We kind of know who they are. Like, I, I don't know about you. Like, I'm, we're starting Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt. We can stream Von Bell and Geno Stone kind of as needed. They're full-time players. I'm not starting anyone on the defensive line other than Trey Hendrickson, but he's banged up. Um, so he, he was dealing with a neck stinger. Um, so I don't know if he's going to play or not for sure. But if he's playing, you, you probably feel fine about starting him. It's not the best matchup in the world, but he's been so good that he's, he's another guy that's kind of tough to bench. But yeah, I'm not starting Sam Hubbard. Sam Hubbard is officially the worst pass rushing edge in the NFL right now. He is a 42.1 pass rush grade, which ranks 118th out of 118 qualifying edges. Wow. And he's, and he's not getting that tackle floor. He used to get right. either, which that was his value back in the day was you're going to get like five combined tackles out of, of a defensive end each week. And that was great. Uh, so, so let me ask you this. I saw something today that said miles Murphy is getting close ish to coming back. Yeah, he got uh, he got his practice window was um, opened up. That's what it was. He was on IR um, for the first four weeks, so that was nice to see that uh, like they they've immediately kind of opened that practice window for him. Because I I I feel good about well I I felt good about Miles Murphy coming into that that rookie draft and even coming out of it. I knew you know we'd have to be patient on him, and I think there's potential there. And Sam Hubbard's been so bad that I mean. There's got to be hope for for Miles Murphy to work his way in if he's healthy, and I, I got to imagine that you know they spent a first round pick on the guy that this is kind of he's in their future plans, and Sam Hubbard probably not so much. Yeah, exactly. So so right, right. There might be a situation coming here where Murphy you know sees an increase in value and Hubbard sees a decrease. Uh, one thing that did catch my eye on the Bengals last week was uh, DJ Turner and Cam Taylor Britt had a little bit of a switcheroo. Uh, the defensive coordinator, this is a direct quote, called Cam Taylor Britt erratic and then benched him and rotated him with DJ Turner throughout the second half of that game last week. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you know, this is easy for me. Avoid them both. Baltimore isn't the greatest passing offense on the planet to begin with. So, you know, just go elsewhere this yep. week. But any any thoughts on that? Do you think uh, Britt just had a down week or, or what happened there? 
Yeah, that's a. I, I did see that in the the usage, and I, he's not somebody that I'm going to roll out there this week against the Ravens, like you said, for that exact reason. It's just not a great matchup. And then when you see the the usage like that, there's no need to kind of go out and put these guys in the lineups. Just find another option. Wait and see if it kind of turns around. Same thing with Mike Hilton. Like I know Mike Hilton's banged up, and and he might be out, but I'm not playing Mike Hilton this week. The the Ravens are another one of those teams that don't play a lot of 11 personnel. And that's really the only time that Mike Hilton gets on the field as good as he is. That's kind of his role, right? Is to be that slot defender. So um, yeah, I would be avoiding all the the Bengals corners this week. Exactly. And and the Ravens, I feel like finally got the game script they wanted last week, you know, 200 plus yards on the ground. They only threw the ball. I believe it was 16 times and 12 of those were to running back or tight end. Right. So, you know, if you're if you're starting at Bengals corner this week, it's probably not going to go well for you. Yeah, no, definitely uh, avoiding that situation. Um, let's look at the Indianapolis Colts and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, where do you want to start with these these two guys? Uh, let's start with the Colts here. So, yeah, I mean, their defensive line is just destroyed, right? Taekwon Lewis out till at least week nine. Uh, Abby Cam done for the season. DeForest Buckner on IR. Uh, is it is it late to Latu time? Do you think or? It feels like it might be right. I mean, him and and Deo Odeingbo are, are pretty much all they have left. Like Quiddy Pay's not yet back at practice. Like you said, Taekwon Lewis on IR, so both of those guys kind of have to step up. I know Deo had a, had a nice game in Week Four with one and a half sacks. Um, Latu played a career high sixty six percent of the Colts in um, in Week Four. Um, but yeah, I I don't mind them. I mean, Latu. He, he actually now ranks third among all rookie defensive players in PFF grade um, this season, 76.6, um, because he's been such a good run defender. So they could trust him on early downs. Um, and we know he has the pass rush upside. We've seen that coming out of college and going against the Jaguars, who, man, the, the offensive line hasn't been great. Trevor Lawrence hasn't been great. Like, there's potential there if you need, like, a kind of a deep league streamer, like Deo De Ingo and Leatsu Latsu. I, I, I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah, definitely. And and my, my thoughts with, with Jags this week is, I mean, they're 0-4, their season swirling the toilet, they're at home against the second worst rushing offense, or defense, excuse me, in the entire league. Like, th- this could be a huge Etienne week, I feel like, and that's probably their best bet to get this thing back on track. It's not going to be their passing offense. That has been horrendous so far. Yeah, outside of yeah, Brian Thomas Jr., it, it just hasn't looked good like at all. So yeah, I'm with you. I'm still starting. Yeah, the EJ Speeds and, and Zaire Franklins, and then Nick Cross as well, playing in the box there. He's going to be um, called upon there to to help stop that run game as well. So yeah, like that call, Jen. Um, on the Jaguars side of things, uh, Josh Hines Allen was dealing with a concussion. I'm not 100 percent sure if he's going to be cleared to to play this game. If he's not going, I'm not interested in the Jags D line, not against that Colts offensive line, which has been one of the best in the league. That's that's one of the bright spots there for them. So um, zero interest in the Jags offensive line. But I know a lot of people are interested in the linebacker situation. So Devin Lloyd um, didn't play last week. If he can go, he's their top option because Foy is on IR. Um if he can't go, then their top option is Chad Muma. Um, Muma would be the second linebacker if Devin Lloyd plays, but it wouldn't necessarily be a full-time role because of Ryan Nielsen and this ridiculous rotation that he has going. Even when his options are as poor as they are, he's still rotating these guys uh, a, a fair bit. He'll take guys off on passing downs and things like that. So um, Muma would only be a deep league option if um, if Devin Lloyd is active and then Devin Lloyd... Uh, He'll probably be pretty close to a full-time role, but I would not be surprised to see him come off the field for at least a drive uh, or or handful of plays on a drive for something like that. So, um, yeah, it, it's just the weird situation right now with the Jacksonville linebackers. How, how are you feeling about them? Because it's been a mess. Oh, oh yeah, they, they were doing it to Foyer too. Yep. Weren't there? T- I saw like eighty-six percent of snaps one week, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, and and now with the injuries, we're like at inception levels of ridiculous to find out who's actually playing football for them each week. Uh, love when that happens. But but yeah, man, I'm a little worried, like seeing Foyer at anything less than 99, 100 percent of snaps. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, there was there was definitely a cell window that I was trying to push there before the injury. Um, but now I, I think that cell window is closed. You just kind of hope he comes back and, and you know 
can can play a larger role again or if he is back in that 80 percent range then hopefully he's really productive and we maybe have a chance to sell him again but um it's not a great matchup for the jaguars linebackers either this week the colts are 31st in tackles per game to the linebacker position so it's not like we should be desperate to you know put chad muma or or devin lloyd into the lineups either um Carolina and Chicago is next. And speaking of more injuries at the linebacker position, Shaq Thompson out for the year. Um, brutal stuff for him that missed all of last year too. Like you just feel bad for the guy because he, he was having a nice season. He was productive for IDP. It was a good defense for him. Just, yeah, unfortunately, the, the I guess the Achilles it, it will, will do it in. But um, Josie Jewell is also dealing with injuries. Um, he might not play this week because he has a hamstring injury. So, in their place is the rookie linebacker for the Carolina Panthers, Trevin Wallace. Um, I'm expecting him to kind of play almost a full-time role because, uh, like I said, Jack Thompson's out. If Josie Jewell is out, then I, I don't think they have much choice but to play uh, Trevin Wallace in a full-time role. If Josie Jewell's playing, then that's different. He, he probably plays closer to that 70 75% of snaps. But Wallace, you know, he's somebody that we can add off of waivers but he's also in kind of a prime spot to rack up tackles against the Bears who are giving up the third most tackles per game to the linebacker position this season. So he also kind of becomes startable as well. I think I have him as like around the top 20 linebackers this week. Um, he would definitely be somebody uh, that that I'd be looking to, to kind of plug into a lineup. Um, if, again, if Jewel can't go, Cloud and Shareless um, would be the LB2 there, right? So, um, again, you know, it's more of a deep league option because I don't think he'll be a full-time player, but um, just a name to keep in mind because I know there's plenty of people that listen um, that are in deeper leagues as well. Yeah, that was the exact question I had for you. Is it Cheryless or Radigan, whoever that is? Like, right. it's 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 only week five, and we're already you know looking <laughs> looking at guys we didn't know were in the league. This is yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, guys that probably don't have Wikipedia pages even, right? So, it's, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we got those. Those are the kind of the guys that we have to follow here, especially at this point in the year when the bye weeks start coming in, right? So, um, yeah, wouldn't be surprised if Cloud and Cheryless finds his way into some starting lineups this week. Um, but yeah, Trevin Wall is really kind of the one that I'm, I'm most interested in. I think he could be a, a nice option this week. Um, yep. Anything right, else right, for Carolina? Right. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say I grabbed a lot of shares of uh, of him so far off nice. waivers. Um, no, no, nothing, nothing else for Carolina. Fair. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, the Chicago Bears side of things, um, Montez Sweat back to back weeks with a sack. That's been nice to see. Really, kind of just took advantage of an awful Los Angeles Rams offensive line last week. Um, this week, though, tougher matchup. Panthers have one of the best offensive lines in the league. Um, Andy Dalton also doing a much better job than Bryce Young avoiding sacks um, and everything else. That makes it a little bit tougher for Montez Sweat. I don't expect necessarily the sack this week, but he's been so good that you know I, I, I don't mind putting him into a lineup. And again, we might not have better options there. Um, Johnny, Kyler Gordon um, faces the Panthers this week. The, the Panthers have played the fourth highest rate of 11 personnel this season um, at around 79%. So Kyler Gordon... He was somebody that was a 100% player like last year because he was playing a little bit outside, right? But this year, he's basically been exclusively their nickel corner, so coming off um, in certain situations. But feels like a bit of a safer play this week because it's the Panthers and, and based on their their personnel that the that they run out there. Oh yeah, I, I like all of the Chicago corners for different things this mm -hmm. week, right? So, so Kyler Gordon, absolutely great matchup. Tyreek Stevenson, always good, has a little bit extra playing time. Not as good alignment, but still very productive, very consistent. Also in a good matchup. And then Jalen Johnson for all twenty-two is is yeah. excellent. So you know, d take your pick depending on what kind of league you're in. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call. Um... All right, let's go to the Las Vegas Raiders and the Denver Broncos now. Where do you want to start here? Uh, let's start with the man, the myth, the legend, Mad Max. I mean, w one week of, of missing a game is probably all we're going to see out of him, right? Because <laughs> I, I guarantee you, he probably could have played last week if he wanted to. <laughs> It feels like it, right? Like this guy barely misses a snap. Um, it must have killed him to to actually miss a full game. So I I know he didn't practice um today. I don't think, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's just 
them making sure that he's at his healthiest come game time because it's not somebody that needs a lot of practice. I think it's still early in the week too that you know he can get in a, a, a limited practice or so before the game. So, yeah, uh, hoping that he's back this week. I have too many rosters that rely on Max Crosby um, for him to miss another game. So, uh, yeah, how about the how about the safeties there? Um, for the Raiders, I mean, Marcus Epps tore his ACL, so he's been out. So uh, did you pick up any Isaiah Polo Mao um, last week and, and plug him in? Because he had a pretty good matchup and a pretty good game, and it has a nice matchup this week. I, I did. I did. I did not get him last week, but I saw that, and, and I was like, oh, that looks, you know, that looked pretty good. And then I checked the snaps, and I was like, okay, that is good. And then, uh, and you know, Epps isn't coming back. So, yes, I did pick some up this week. Um, nice. Yeah, and Den Denver, Bo Nix, right? Like, he's not pushing it downfield a lot, but he's dinking and dunking a lot. And that I've always found that that's good for opposing safeties and corners, right? Like those, those easy tackles after the 10 yard mm -hmm. catch or whatever, like that's a nice floor to have every week. And, and Nick's has been solid. He's completing like 23 passes a game. If we take out that jets game where, you know, it was raining and it's met life and it's windy and it was right. against a great defense. So I'm just not counting that. So yes, I like this matchup quite a bit. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then the other player, I'm, I'm sure you probably got a lot of questions about him too, is Nate Hobbs. Um, he's been somebody that we we've known has been, you know, a pretty effective tackler when he's on the field, at least in recent seasons, but hasn't really been this season. Um, he's just kind of been, you know, closer to average as far as corners go and doesn't necessarily have the best uh, matchup this week against the Denver Broncos who play, uh, let me see. They're around average in 11 personnel deployment as well. 63%. So Nate Hobbs, who is another one of those corners that's coming off the field in certain situations and against certain personnels, um, don't expect him to necessarily be playing anywhere close to a full-time role this week. And it's already not been as effective. So I, I do worry a little bit about Nate Hobbs, but, but where are you at with him? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, I, I tend to take the 30,000 foot view and we've seen, you know, season after season of production and consistency. So I'm not like at red alert yet. I'm, I'm obviously a little worried. Uh, but, but, you know, we were talking about this before we kicked off here, passing offense in general and offense across the league is down across right. the board as well. And everyone's rusty and you can see it getting a little bit better each week. And it, and as that improves, cornerback production improves, right? As, as there are more completed passes, as there's more wide receiver targets, it gets easier for these corners to produce. So if he's still doing this in like another three weeks, then I'm, I'll be freaking out a thousand percent. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a minute at the moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a fair way to look at it, right? And and like you said, he, he's been somebody that has been effective for us in the past, and we know that he could be a solid tackler. So things could definitely turn around there and potentially get better matchups as well, which which can always help. Um, on the Denver Broncos side of things, Zach Allen has been excellent. He, he played... Um, Every defensive snap for the Broncos last week played 100% of snaps. Not something that you see out of defensive linemen that are not named Max Crosby. So, I mean, he continues to be just one of the better DT options in, in those kind of formats, right? Because um, volume alone, he's been productive. So I know he's been one of the top scorers for um, IDP as well. But other than that, I mean, obviously we know Alex Singleton um, out for the year. Crazy that he played that game with a torn ACL when that came out like that. That's insane to me. Yeah. I, I don't know how he pulled it off. Like I, I didn't think that that was physically possible, but right. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then what do you think about, I mean, we've seen Cody Barton before that's, that's not a terrible backup option. I, I grabbed some of that this week. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, he's going to be that hundred percent snap guy for them so that he's in a nice spot to kind of be productive because of that. Um, yeah, I'm fine with. I'm definitely fine with Cody Barton, and then their LB two is is Justin Sternat now, who, who played um, 77 percent of snaps last week. It's a decent sized role again for the kind of those deeper sized leagues um, where we're you know we're not necessarily able to get full time linebackers every time. So um, yeah, I think both these guys can can kind of be fine rest of the season as long as they're healthy. I mean, I know they're not household names or or the best linebackers in the world, but again, like production is king and our volume is king and, and they're going to be productive because of it. Right. So um, yeah, fine with those guys for sure. 
Yep, definitely. Um, and and then yeah, we got to talk about Riley yeah, Moss. Sure. So, so what do you, what have your thoughts been so far? This guy. So we're in that you know all cornerback league, and and I obviously live in cornerback land. He has been the talk of the town uh, with my people because um, you know this 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 guy is awesome, man. Not only has he been crushing his projection almost every single week with like the exception of one so far but he's he's actually good too like all 22 good it's it's kind of crazy yeah no he's been he's been so good for for idp and like you said he's he's been grading well as well so um this is another one of those kind of even as good as he's been the lesser of two evils right because patrick sertan is on the other side of him right and he, he is a full-time player um but you look at, you know, kind of what is the difference between Patrick Sertan and Riley Moss. So Riley Moss has played slightly fewer snaps than Sertan. I think uh, it looks like nine fewer snaps, so 255 compared to Sertan's 264. Moss has been targeted 25 times. Um, Patrick Sertan has been targeted just 11 times. Um <laughs> <laughs> right so there is your lesser of two evils theory to put to work there and then the same thing with jaquan mcmillian who's their their nickel corner right like he's played under 200 snaps like just under 189 or something like that and he's the most targeted cornerback on the team um so again it's the lesser of three evils per perhaps there um between uh sertan and riley moss and so denver has two of the top 10 most targeted cornerbacks in the league so far um, because <laughs> Patrick Sertan is so good and they're just looking to go elsewhere in, uh, when they're passing against this team. And that leads to production. So that's, that's been nice to see. Oh, I, I love that. Cause we see that in multiple places across the league. DJ Reed, it, I, I feel like is, is very valuable because of that, you know, sauce scares people. So they don't throw at him last year, Deron Bland with Trayvon Diggs on the other side. I mean, there, there are multiple examples across the years and uh, I feel like it's a real thing. I might be nuts, but I feel like no. it's a real thing. I think, I think you're right. I, I mean, it just makes sense, right? Just from a game planning perspective, like do not throw against Patrick Sertan unless we absolutely have to. So the other options are Riley Moss and, and Jake Juan McMillian. So, uh, and the same thing, yeah, like with the Jets, like you said, and um, yeah, McMillian for what it's worth, again, another one of those guys not playing hundred percent of snaps Raiders kind of just above average in 11 personnel rate at 67%. Um, but somehow they are a top 10 matchup for, for tackles allowed to the position. So could be another nice rally Moss week. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely a, a fun little matchup there for, for these Denver corners. Um, all right, let's see. Arizona San Francisco is next here. Um, and I want to start with the Arizona uh safeties. Um, because Jalen Thompson, I mean, along with Buda Baker, Buda Baker's been amazing. We're 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 starting him. There's there's not a question about it at this point. Um, but I think both of these guys right now in a great spot to produce this week. Uh, they face off against the San Francisco 49ers who are yielding the third most tackles per game to the safety position at 16.3. And th so this is crazy. The most encouraging thing maybe about Thompson is that he is playing a ton in the box. And last week he played 80% of his snaps in the box. So that's week four. Um, that's an incredibly high number. We do not ever see that uh, from a safety and probably won't happen again, but they are facing a run heavy 49ers team this week. Um, and given Arizona's tendency too to deploy more one linebacker looks like Jalen Thompson might be called upon again to line up closer to the line of scrimmage for a lot of his snaps, him and Buda Baker. So that usage that this matchup to me, both of these guys are kind of locked in uh, starting options in, in most formats. Oh yeah, no doubt. And, and San Francisco's number one time of possession team in the league too. So you may be getting some extra defensive snaps out of that. Um, and, and you're right. The, the, the alignment is so important with your safeties. Uh, you know, we, we both got that question. We were tagged in on Twitter last week when someone was asking about Minka. Um, I don't have any Minka cause he lines up deep. I, I knew that before the season. Right. <laughs> 91 percent. yeah he's been he's been super deep um there was like a shift last year where I, he was playing like a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage but then they just said screw that and they they basically basically kept him um really really deep uh for for the majority of his snaps but like what we're seeing for the arizona safeties at least um and then on the san francisco side of things because again there's not a ton of interesting stuff there with the arizona cardinals so we'll move to san francisco where fred warner I haven't heard like anything significant about his injury. I, I don't think he's practicing just yet. Um, 
Demetrius Flanagan fouls. I, I picked him up in a few places just in case. I, I don't know if Fred Warner's going to miss time. He's he's considered day to day, so might not miss this game. If he does, then Devondre Campbell and Demetrius Flanagan fouls should be full time players um, this week, which is a, a nice spot for them. Obviously, sucks for Fred Warner, but that's a player that we would be looking to find his replacement. And um, Demetrius Flanagan fouls. That's that's the name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've picked that guy up before as a replacement. Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah. What, what do you think about Hafunga? Like how interested are you when he does eventually come back? Because it, for me, like when I look at these box scores from San Fran every week, it, it feels like their style of play hurts their IDP production. They, they like to run. They like to control the clock. They don't play a lot of defense in general. I feel like, um, and when they do, they play it well. So they're making the other team go three and out pretty quickly. And there's not a lot of opportunity for tackles and whatnot. Yeah. And that's the thing like Hufanga too, I think kind of a slightly overrated, you know, as far as being an IDP goes, because I, I think, you know, he had, he looks like Troy Polamalu when he's on the field. Right. So a lot of people think that he's going to produce like Troy Polamalu. So it's not really the case. Like he's not like this box heavy safety, um, or at least that's not the way that San Francisco deploys him. Like he does, there are games where he plays a little bit more in the box, but he, like last year specifically before he got hurt and, and things like that, like he was, he was playing mostly deep. So wasn't really that productive. So to me, just kind of treating him as another one of those kind of matchup dependent, just full-time safeties. Um, yeah, he was, he came back in week three, then missed week four. So, We'll see if he plays or not, but um, Malik Mustafa is is his backup, and then Jair Brown is is the other option there. But neither one of these guys are are kind of must starts by by any means. Yep. Um, how about with the Giants and the Seattle Seahawks here, Johnny? Where where do you want to start with uh, with these two? Uh, yeah, a little bit of movement in the cornerback core due to injury. Surprise, surprise uh, for the Giants here. So Andrew Phillips was out last week. That gave Cordell Flott a little bit of a bump in a perfect matchup against Dallas, who literally, if you breathe on Dallas too hard, they abandon the run and start throwing the ball. Like that that has just been the Cowboys for years now. Uh, so it worked out great. He had a huge game last week. And then we saw uh, Nick McLeod as the direct replacement, but only played about 60% of snaps or so. Right. But what, what are your thoughts on uh, Phillips and Cordell Flatt, the, uh, the two new youngsters there? Yeah. Yeah. I was excited about um, Phillips coming into the year. Like I picked him up in a few places just because I, I figured he'd be this, this starting slot corner here. It hasn't been healthy, which has been kind of the problem, but we did see the ceiling, right? When he, when he was in that, that one game, that was a, a massive performance. So I have to imagine like he's going to be the starter if he's healthy again, which, which will bump out flot. Right. But if not, like Cordell flots, not, not a bad option for, for IDP purposes, right? Like playing in the slot, Seattle playing the seventh highest rate of 11 personnel as well. Um, they're also the number one matchup for IDP corners as far as tackles allowed goes. So could be some really high upside here, whether it's Andrew Phillips or Cordell Flott. If, if Phillips is active, then I, I'm fine to start him. Um, if not, then Cordell Flott for sure. And then even like a Deontay Banks, for example, I think could be a nice, um, nice option this week as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm with you on that across the board. Yep. Nice. And then Giants D-line, um, I don't know. Thibodeau got a sack last week. He actually kind of performed well by our metrics for the first time. Um, he was working against the the Cowboys rookie left tackle, Tyler Guyton, who, who struggled a little bit this year, right? I think he ended up with like a 33-something pass block grade um, in that Thursday night game. So it wasn't his best game either. But it was Thibodeau's best game since uh, his three-sack game in week eight of last year uh, against the Jets. Uh, he just hasn't looked dominant by any means at, at any point consistently in the NFL. Um, still not somebody that I have to start uh, or feel like he he's, you know, a starting consideration just yet because he hasn't done it consistently. Like it's not a bad matchup going against the Seahawks O-line, but Gino has done a nice job avoiding sacks. Again, we saw it Monday night football against um, Aiden Hutchinson just wasn't able to get to him. Um, so that makes it a little bit trickier, but I'm not quite there yet with Thibodeau, but probably fine with Brian Burns and, and then Dexter Lawrence as well. Yeah. Dexter Lawrence. Awesome. Always. He he's, you know what, of the defensive tackles, he's been solid so far this yeah. year. Yeah. 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 He's been excellent. Um, how, how are you feeling about Bobby Okereke? Cause um, a lot of people frustrated, frustrated by him as well. 
are you he's another one again it's early in the season he's a hundred percent snap player are you are you concerned at all no no be, be, we were talking about this before we kicked off too yeah. things have to line up for you to get the production you want out of your idp players it's like you said it's a reactionary position it's a defense is reactionary you don't get to dictate what happens you get to adjust to what happens to you so there are going to be weeks where you're just not in position to do what we want you to do and that and it is what it is he's still a super productive hundred percent of snaps linebacker and they are going out of style. They are going extinct. Yeah. So if you have one, you play him. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing, right? Like I think a lot of people are ready to kind of replace Bobby O'Karake with Micah McFadden judging by a lot of the questions that I get. Um, and Micah McFadden, you know, he's been very efficient, but he's not a hundred percent snap player, right? He, he's around that 75% snap range, which across an entire season, Bobby O'Karake is going to end up with more production because of that, right? So we just got to kind of stick with it, understand that this is kind of the ebbs and flows of the game. And, you know, we're playing a long haul here and um, Bobby O'Karake, he'll, he'll be fine. Even if, you know, you got to use him based on matchups or something like that. Like it's not the best matchup this week necessarily, but I don't know how many people have much better options um, heading into this week than, than O'Karake. Yeah, and and Okereke had what was it like eight combined tackles last week and a tackle for loss, something like yeah. that. That's yeah. not that's that's not bad. It's it's all relative, right? Like you're not going to have a forty point game every week out of these guys. Sometimes you just got to settle for double digits and be happy with it. And it you know it could be worse. And that was that last week. Yep, exactly. It's better than a goose egg. Um, so uh, let's talk about the Seattle Seahawks a little bit because. On the defensive line, um, Boye Mafe and Uchenna and Wosu both missed last game. Um, I, I thought and Wosu would probably be back because he wasn't placed on IR to start the year, and that was kind of the you know the four games um, he still missed them. But maybe he's back this week. Boye Mafe has been excellent. Hopefully, he gets back. If not, are you trusting Derek Hall um, at all in, in your lineups? I honestly, I do not have any Derek Hall going this week. It, it, and and just to be real with you, that that has been so much of a dumpster fire. I have not <laughs> not had the bandwidth to to track it. I'm busy tracking 96 plus right, right. corners every week. <laughs> I don't have time for the Seattle defensive line. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Um, I I'm with you. It's it's one of those situations we that we literally can't stay on top of all of it at at once. But yeah. If <laughs> if Boye Mafe and Ingenna and Wosu are out again, like that, that's kind of where it is a, a better spot for Derek Hall because he played 81% of snaps last week, but and he's been really productive. Um, he's like a top 10 IDP scorer right now for 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 edges, at least in our scoring. So for that reason, you could put him in. But if Mafe and Inwosu are back, then you just got to be aware of that kind of situation and know that those snaps are going to come down quite a bit. And Daniel Jones, surprisingly, done a nice job um, avoiding sacks as well. Um, and then linebacker-wise, we'll see if Jerome Baker's back. If Jerome Baker's back, then he's going to play a full-time role. He could be startable alongside Tyrell Dodson. Um, Tyrese Knight uh, has been filling in nicely here, has been efficient with his snaps, not a full-time role. Um, but if Jerome Baker's out, uh, that that's the only situation that we'll be trusting Tyrese Knight. And then Julian Love also, he's been one of the better safeties for IDP, suffered a quad injury um, in week four, did not return to the game. And the Seahawks did not deploy one single safety to replace him. They were deployed a rotation of Kayvon Wallace and Kobe Bryant. So uh, not that Kobe Bryant, obviously, but um, yeah, not making a, a chance here to, to look for the Julian Love uh, replacement just yet. Yep. No, I'm with you. And, and, and I, I see that a lot in cornerback land too. Sometimes it's not a direct replacement. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, a bunch of guys combining yeah. to be one guy and that's not great. We don't like that. Nope, we do not. Um, let's go to the next game, green Bay and the Los Angeles Rams. So, um, okay. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the Packers, off or defensive line sorry going against the rams offensive line the rams offensive line have been worse than the cleveland browns at least as far as pass blocking grade goes um they only 39.6 pass blocking grade on the year that is by far the worst um, matthew stafford has been in the bottom 10 in the league in pressure to sack conversion rate as well so there's opportunity here for the packers defensive line the only problem is I have a really hard time trusting Rashawn Gary right now, just because he hasn't put the pass rush metrics together and hasn't really looked like himself. He's somebody that 
I still trust is going to put it together, but I want to see it first. Right. And if he can't do it this week against the Rams offensive line, I'm worried that he might never do it. I, I, you know, I sound like somebody that's kind of panicking a little bit and I, I am on Rashawn Gary, right? It's a terrible offensive line for the Rams. So even if he doesn't get a sack, I, I want to see him put up the pass rush metrics that we, you know, are used to from him. And he hasn't even done that this season. So just kind of keeping an eye on the situation because Rashawn Gary was somebody that I think a lot of people had high hopes for. And I think yeah. eventually kind of puts it together, but it just hasn't been there yet. So maybe more of a matchup for like a Preston Smith, um, Devonte Wyatt in DT required leagues. If he's healthy, he's been excellent. Um, I would definitely be happy to plug Devonte Wyatt into a lineup, but how, how are you feeling? I, I know I, I sound like one of those people that's panicking on a player uh, only four weeks into the season, but Rashawn Gary has definitely been somebody that has been on the radar of concern here. Yeah, no, I've, I've got him obviously in a few places and uh, yeah, no, it, I mean, it's, a, it's on my radar, probably going to give it another couple few weeks just to yeah. see how it goes. But like you said, especially this week, there are guys that need guys off waivers that aren't as well known. Like this is a great Preston Smith week. Uh, like, you know, um, yeah, so that's where I would go with it. Is it, you know, I'd recommend more of those deeper guys uh, for the for the one week starter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just picking on the Rams' offensive line because they've been so bad. Um, and then Keyshawn Nixon, Johnny, uh, another one of those nickel corners um, who has been amazing. Like we've seen his snaps kind of fluctuate week to week as well. But then Jair Alexander missed last week, so Keyshawn Nixon got to play outside and in the slot and kept him as a as a full time player, which you love to see. Um, he's in another great spot to kind of produce this week, um, in CB required leagues, right? Like he, he's again, split his time with Alexander out last week, but even if Alexander does play this week, like he's going against the Los Angeles Rams who play the highest rate of 11 personnel in the league at 11 at, at 87%. So he's going to be on the field a ton, regardless, um, if Alexander plays or not. And the Rams have also given up the second most tackles per game to the opposing cor cornerback. So just an ideal matchup all the way around for, for the Packers corners. Um, and specifically for me, Keyshawn Nixon, but, but how about, how, how do you feel? How are you ranking these, these Packers corners? Oh yeah. hundred percent. I'm with you on that. So, so traditionally for me, Keyshawn's been the more consistent, productive guy and Jair has been the weak winner. It's just not going to happen as often, you know, maybe, yep. you know, cup, couple times a season, two, three times a season type deal. What what I found interesting is Keyshawn has had 24 return yards in week one, but only one return yard since then. So we're missing a big chunk of his value that we were pretty sure was going to be there going into the season. Just hasn't happened yet. Just, I, I assume just the way things line up. I mean, he's, right. he's still, I checked the depth chart. He's still a kick and punt returner. So, yeah. you know, I, I just guess it hasn't lined up. When that happens, we're getting that on top of the production we're already getting and it's just going to get even better yeah yeah those um punts and kick return leagues he's been uh amazing um and I, he's probably drafted as cb1 in a lot of those leagues for that reason but yeah it just hasn't been there um this season whether teams are kicking to uh, you know avoid him or just again the new rules maybe not working out the way the nfl intended as far as you know increasing the amount of uh returns but um yeah that's kind of it for the packers for me um i want to talk about the rams here Let's look at the Rammers. Um, Jared Verse, um, second best win rate among all edge defenders this season, um, which is pretty wild. Uh, really tough matchup this week, though. Zach Tom and Rashid Walker have been excellent offensive tackles for the Green Bay Packers. And Jordan Love has been the best in the league at not letting pressures turn into sacks. So love what Jared Verse is doing, but don't love the matchup at all um, this week against Green Bay. Yep. No, I'm with you on that. And then uh, what's going on with Troy Reader? I, I saw a questionable. Uh, I mean, I must have missed that injury. Is is he likely this week or? Yeah. So then he was questionable. And then I think I got a notification like pretty close to before we came on and he his status changed from questionable to healthy. So he must have practiced today. Um, nice. to, to kind of get rid of that tag. So that, that's been nice because yeah, the Rams, I, I don't want to have to figure out who the, the, the hey. third man up is in this Rams core. Hey. No, and pleasant, pleasant surprise. I mean, <clears throat> not pleasant for me because I drafted Cam Curl everywhere instead, but Quentin Lake 
Where did oh, this guy been... come from? What is that? Yeah, he's been so good. Uh, yeah, he's he's getting the better alignment than Curl. Like Curl's still getting like a fair bit of, in the box, but he's just playing more deep than Quentin Lake. Where Quentin Lake's splitting his time between the slot and the box, so um, he's like safety too for me this week. I, I love Quentin Lake. Um, what? Are they, yeah, Packers giving up the seventh most tackles per game to the line or to the safety position as well. So just in another spot um, to again to kind of produce here. So. He's been definitely excellent. A lot of people picked him up off waivers and definitely find starting him over Cameron Curl if you have to. Yeah, yeah. Him and him and Nick Cross, uh, definitely the two safety yeah. waivers of the year so far, I'd say. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, Johnny, your Dallas Cowboys are playing on Sunday night football. They just love their primetime games. They're playing against your other favorite team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah. You got to be excited for this one. Uh, where would you like to start with uh, with this Sunday night football game? Okay, so I'm I'm not excited. First of all, <laughs> I, I've you know going into this season with Jerry screwing around and not paying the contracts, I was not excited to begin with. Um, <laughs> And and I would just say this: if the Steelers don't run it down Dallas's throat, then then there's something wrong with them because Dallas was better on their rush defense last week. But you know, the first three weeks is is the real Dallas rush defense, right? right. Not not what we saw against the Giants and Singletary. So I would expect a heavy dose of Najee Harris. Uh, but yeah, back to IDP stuff. Not great, man. Parsons and D Law, uh, not good. I know. <laughs> This is yeah, this is brutal. I Lawrence, I, I think they're saying he's gonna be on IR, right? And yeah, yeah. probably like they're saying potentially eight weeks uh, he could be out. Like that's that sucks because he's a really good player. Micah Parsons, yeah, he's gonna be out this week, potentially next week. We'll see what happens there. But any interest in like anybody else on the Dallas defensive line, a Marshawn Neeland or anybody like that stand out to you? I mean, this would have been the perfect opportunity for Sam Williams, but he's already gone for the season too. So, <laughs> right, so right. I mean, not not really. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. We'll see what happens this week. You know, look at the snaps and whatnot. Um, for me, it's it's a guessing game because we haven't seen it before. So, you know, I don't know who's going to play how much. So, yeah, yeah, it'll probably be one of those situations where we do see like kind of a heavy rotation with the Marshawn Nealand and. Um, who else do they got? They got Carl Lawson in there as well. Oh my god! <laughs> right, the blast from the past. So yeah. there, there's, you know, they, they're, they're going to have a mix of guys. So we'll wait till somebody kind of emerges there. But no need to kind of rush into this. Not an amazing matchup. Um, it is a really great matchup for the Dallas Cowboys uh, linebackers because, um, like you said, the Pittsburgh Steelers they're going to run the ball under Arthur Smith and DeMarvian Overshown has kind of been, you know, a bit of a star here. Eric Hendricks has been amazing. I, I'm definitely starting Eric Hendricks as well. Oh, yeah. um, but it, I think it's worth talking about DeMarvian Overshown specifically because he's slowly kind of seen his role increase, at least over the past couple of weeks, right? He had that weird game in, in week two where he barely played. I, I don't know what was up with that, even though he was clearly the best linebacker out there along with Kendricks. But um, right now he's not quite a hundred percent snap player, but it might not be long until he gets there because especially if he keeps performing well, right? And um, facing the Steelers this week who give up the most tackles per game to the linebacker position. So even without a guaranteed like full-time role, Overshown kind of stands out as like one of those ideal streamers for me um, in fantasy lineups. And there's always the chance that he could be a full-time player this week as well if his snaps trends continues. Yep. Oh yeah. I, I have intentionally set this thing up so that I've got Najee and DFS this weekend. Uh, and then Overshawn in some, you know, leagues where I need a, a one week nice. starter, uh, you know, so I'm getting both ends of this thing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're playing both sides. So you always come out on top and that is the absolute best way to do it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it, it, I, I love it. Um, and, and yeah, Overshawn, definitely a good call. I, I, I think he, I think he could be really solid and yeah, Eric Kendricks has just been, um, excellent. Uh, so on the Pittsburgh side of things, um, Expected more from Nick Herbig, uh, you know, after the big uh, week, whatever that was, week three, two sack game. But at the same time, like it was a tougher matchup, obviously, against the Colts, right? The Colts, again, being one of those um, elite offensive lines. But this week he faces um, the Cowboys offensive line. We just talked about the rookie there, Tyler Guyton, their, their left tackle. And Herbig's going to line up almost exclusively against Tyler Guyton because of the way that the Steelers deploy their edge rushers. TJ Watt lines up exclusively against the right tackle pretty much. Um, Taylor, Tyler Guyton 
a 33.0 pass blocking grade against Kayvon Thibodeau last week, who's been, like I said, really ineffective in his NFL career, gave up a sack in that one. Um, I think he's given up a sack every game um, this season as well. So I definitely do expect Herbig to have a, a much better game here in, in week five. But yeah, how, how are you feeling about your Cowboys offensive line? You think this is a, a decent one to attack? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's not, it's not the great wall of Dallas anymore. That's no. for sure. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Um, and then Patrick queen, wh- wh- where are you at on him? He's another <clears throat> one of those full-time guys, but has not done anything. Um, any, any kind of panic level there for him? Oh, oh I already blasted him out the air <laughs> in, in, in many places, many yeah. places, uh, be, because, you know, we're, we're at that part of the season where we're still, you know, seeing guys that we didn't know were going to be as good as they are and you yeah. can get them, you know, before everyone else figures it out. So I saw that with, um, you know, it was Shaq Thompson. It's, it's going to have to be someone else now, but I, there was a lot of blasting Qu- uh, queen out the airlock to get <laughs> Shaq Thompson, uh, because, you know, Carolina was going to stink and be on defense a lot. He was a hundred percent of snaps guy and he was out producing Patrick queen, like two to one, yeah. three to one every week. Yeah, it's he's just been so inefficient. Like to me, like it's nice that he has the full time role, but really what he is now at this point is just kind of a matchup dependent player. Um, You know, if it's a positive matchup for linebackers, you can plug him in if you need to. But otherwise, he's not somebody that's a must start kind of in that LB three territory. And Dallas given up the 20th most tackles per game to the linebacker position. So it's not like the ideal matchup for him again this week. Um and yeah, it wasn't last week either. We talked about it and he he stunk up the joint again. So um, yeah, not interested in Patrick Queen as much. So final game of the week, and we only got one Monday night football game this week. Um, it's the New Orleans Saints at the Kansas City Chiefs. So um, starting with more injuries at the linebacker position, Demario Davis has been banged up. So um, actually, so is Willie Gay. Uh, so they're really down to Pete Werner. It, you know, if Demario Davis can't go, Pete Werner would play a full-time role. Um, if Willie Gay can't go as well, um, they had DeMarco Jackson, uh, as their LB two. So again, just more of that deeper league, um, type option. there. not necessarily somebody that we have to start, but just keeping in mind that if Willie Gay and DeMario Davis are both out, he might be an option for you. Um, how are you feeling about these new Orleans corners? Because they have been the stars uh, so far for, uh, cornerback leagues. Um, they are tearing it up. Paulson Adebo and Alante Taylor. What's blowing my mind is is Lattimore's there too, and he hasn't done much, and he has traditionally been yeah. among the best, most productive, and most consistent IDP cornerback options on the planet, and he is just not really even there anymore because these two are just so good. Like Adebo is an automatic must start every week, no matter the matchup, and that's crazy. Yeah. Like that that should never be a thing, and unless it's like Antoine Winfield Senior, you know what I mean? Right, right. Like, <laughs> you know, you got to go into the past a good decade plus to find someone like that, and that's Adebo right now. And then yeah. Alante Taylor, um, you know, the playing time was a concern, but that's gotten a lot better this season, and he's blitzing off the edge and getting those like. Yeah. That, that that two sack game to start the season or whatever that was three sack game three sacks, whatever three, yeah, yeah three sacks yeah that's crazy and when you get that from a cornerback that's such an x factor on top of what you're already getting with the pass breakups and the tackles and everything it's just it's awesome yeah, yeah it's uh it's been amazing these guys have been excellent they're, they're gonna be so hard you just can't sit them i mean alante taylor even you know his snaps again fluctuating a, a little bit because of the you know his role in that defense and Chiefs aren't like a heavy 11 personnel team. They rank, uh, what do they rank? 25th um, in 11th personnel, 11 personnel playing time at 56%. But I'm not benching Alante Taylor at this point. And then Paulson Adebo too, probably the safer bet of the two this week. But I think both of these guys, again, you just continue to leave in their lineups just because they've been so, so good. Um, yeah. And then on the Kansas City side of things, uh, not a ton here. The linebackers, it's a nice matchup here on paper for the Kansas City Chiefs linebackers. Saints giving up the second most tackles per game to the position. Um, Nick Bolton is still treating him kind of more in that LB2 range for me. He's he's becoming a little bit more matchup dependent as well, just based on his, his usage and his production. But um, the matchup is definitely right this week for, for Nick Bolton and, and a 100% snap player. So it's always harder to bench those kind of guys, especially in matchups like this. But how are you feeling about the Chiefs linebackers, the Tranquils and the, and the Leo Chanel's and Bolton's of the world? 
I, I honestly don't have too many of them. I, I was using uh, Chanel in all 22 for a minute, but he's okay. actually, his, his snaps are fluctuating so much that he's under that 20 right. um, cutoff sometimes. So, you know, I, I can't risk that. Uh, yeah. So I don't, I don't have a ton. Um, I, as weird as this sounds, I'd probably want Tranquil more than Bolton right now. Um, is, is that crazy? I mean, Tranquil has been the more productive player, right? And it's, I think it's not like a crazy difference in their snaps either. Like Tranquil was still playing pretty close to 90%. It wasn't quite there. So it's not like a huge difference. And yeah, I mean, just potentially they're close enough that, I mean, I, I still prefer Bolton, but again, it's a nice matchup here for both of these guys. So I, I don't mind Tranquil at, at all as, as an option. Yeah, no, definitely. Gr great matchup with the Saints. We've been using them on IDP bets a lot as, uh, you know, the opposing inside linebacker across from the Saints usually has a pretty good day. Uh, nice. Tra Trey Anderson, etc. cetera. Um, let me let me ask you this. Do you think Jalen Watson is getting the benefit of the lesser of two evils effects with McDuffie on the other side? Yeah, it feels like it. Um, yeah, Trent McDuffie's been really good. Um, yeah, Jalen Watson, I, I, that's a good one to kind of compare their um, targets as well because I bet you it's a very similar situation as as what we kind of saw in Denver. But um, yeah, J Jalen Watson, he's had his good games too, right? Like he's been, he's not a bad corner either. It's just that Trent McDuffie has been so much better, I guess. So um, if I were to look at their corners, yeah, I mean, Jalen Watson, 20 targets that he's faced. Um, so far this season. So that's on the higher end for, for the position where Trent McDuffie is he's uh, 15 targets. So yeah. So uh, Jalen Watson getting more targets there. Um, yeah. Trent McDuffie still solid as well. Not a bad option for IDP, but the other guy that's kind of emerged in that Kansas city um, secondary has been Shamari Connor, um, who he's going to be playing the, the saints this week. So that this is where I do kind of worry about like certain guys like this and, and worried about Jamari Connor last week as well. And, and he didn't, I think he only had three tackles, right? He he's blown up on big plays, but playing against the saints, the saints play the second lowest rate of 11 personnel. And they're also the most run heavy offense in the entire league. So that's not a situation where Steve Spagnuolo is necessarily going to be deploying Jamari Connor. Cause he's, basically playing him in the exact opposite situations as that. So I'd imagine that Shamari Connor's snap roll or snap share this week is probably closer to that 50% range, which is not something that we're, you know, targeting in most leagues, right? So he'd be somebody that I'd be looking to sit this week, but I do like Jalen Watson and uh, Trent McDuffie still. Yeah, no, no, Connor has definitely had some spike weeks and he's definitely been useful. But like you said, the playing time fluctuates. It was 82 percent against Atlanta, 55 percent last week. When you're seeing a 30 percent roller coaster ride <laughs> like that week to week. I mean, that's I, I just am not going to deal with that. So personally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want that. And yeah, Atlanta's what, like, I think the second highest rate of 11 personnel right so it makes sense that they'd be trying to put the extra defensive back out there but um new orleans is not that team um very different uh type of offense there so just something to keep in mind for people that are still chasing chamari connor's points um there will be better opportunities to play him um Johnny, that's going to do it for us. Um, so thank you all so much for tuning in, watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff. I very, very much appreciate it. Um, hopefully that helps you guys win your matchups this week. And if you still have questions, always feel free to ask in the comment section or reach out via Twitter, whatever you'd like to do. Um, I always do my best to get to them all. Always um, a, a, a pleasure to talk to you guys and always a pleasure to talk to Johnny the Greek as well. So a huge thank you to you, Johnny, uh, for dropping knowledge on us all, getting us ready for week five. I, I thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, I, I really do appreciate it, man. Oh, thank you, my friend. It's it's always a pleasure. Love talking to you. Um, more so about like Batman and sure. uh you know <laughs> stuff like that but this is okay too so so thank yeah. you for having me <laughs> yeah man well we'll, we'll talk about the uh, the penguin series which we've been enjoying here the first two episodes and yeah video games and all that fun stuff but uh you know on on here we got to talk a little bit of idp just to you know make sure that we, we pay the bills a little bit but <laughs> <laughs> um speaking of which johnny before you go do please let everybody know uh where they can find more of you and your work as well Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, over at the IDP show dot com, I'm doing cornerback corner uh, every week that that'll help you find the best streaming corner options uh, throughout the season. Uh, doing a lot of betting stuff this year. That's obviously getting popular. Um, 
IDP bets on the IDP show, uh, IDP plus money line uh, over at IDP plus, and then uh, best bets uh, at, over at IDP plus. So many coals in the fire and uh, at orange man, three, one, four, two on Twitter. Nice. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Make sure you're following Johnny and all of his work. He will definitely set you right and help you win quite a few matchups every single week. Um, as for me, IDP fantasy report, uh, is out now. I'll link that into the episode description. Um, that'll list all my waiver wire targets, snap shares, utilization nuggets, and, and plenty of my thoughts and notes for every single team as well. Um, the IDP rankings article I'll link into the episode description as well. Help sort out some of those start sit questions for people, um, within that article. And then, uh, yeah, I'll be back on Monday morning with a week five IDP recap. So be sure to check that out as well. Again, appreciate you all. Good luck this week. And until next time, 